Aloha, everybody. Aloha, Pastor Mark. Happy Fourth of July. To you as well, we've been singing some great patriotic songs and uh, reminded of the great sacrifice that we have uh, talked about today in order to do what we're about to do. So let's step right into the Word of God. We are in John 13. We have moved past the halfway point of the gospel, and we are within 24 hours of the death of our Savior. So uh, we'll, we'll look at the calendar picture here in a minute of how that unfolds, but we are now in the direct focus of the cross as uh, just hours now away. I was at a pastor's conference this past week from Sunday night to Wednesday night and uh, I heard some great teaching and I got to know some pastors from uh, out of the country and local pastors as well. But uh, Pastor Tim Chaddock is uh, from a church in Ventura, Reality Church. He started Reality Church in Los Angeles and then started a Reality Church in London and is now ministering in Ventura. But he had the, the one takeaway statement that I took as he was sharing out of Isaiah 61. And he made this statement and it stuck with me. He said, um, wounds that are not transformed are transferred hmm. wounds that are not transformed are transferred and i thought about that and i thought boy that is that is every kind of wound it's the emotional wound it's the physical wounds it's the mental wounds and the spiritual wounds and if they're not transformed by god then they're transferred either to depression or anger or hurt to other people. And here as we come to this Passover table this morning as we study John chapter 13, this is the savior that takes all of those wounds and says, let me transform them. With my very wounds that Isaiah prophesied about, with the wounds that will come upon me on the cross, let me take those and transform them into your healing and in your life. I'm gonna move a little closer to our recording. I forgot to do that. I like to be in spinning distance of Carol too. That's the nice <laughs> part too. Uh, he will take our wounds and transform them if we continue to give them to him. And that is what happens in this great passage that we study out of John 13. Uh, I wanna read for you Philippians 2, that's often referred to as the great kenosis or the emptying of Christ. But Philippians 2, verse 5 and following says, Adopt this same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, key for our study today, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ to the glory of God is Lord. The emptying, the leaving of heaven, the leaving of his divine rights to set aside, to become a man, to do what he's going to do in the next 24 hours. We're also told by Jesus himself, we'll come across it in a couple weeks in John 15, verse 13, that greater love hath no man than this, that one would lay down his life for another. And all of this teaching ahead of time, all of this training of the disciples is to get them to understand that the life of obedience in Christ is really serving other people. It's humbling ourselves as he himself did in that kenosis, that emptying, humbling ourselves 
so that we can truly love. You, you cannot truly love in the agape sense of unconditional love. You cannot truly love until you've humbled yourself. And Jesus is in the midst of doing that on his way to the cross. But even in this episode and this account that we study now, this now is Thursday night, the night before he goes to the cross. And he is celebrating Passover with his disciples, Thursday night of his final week. And the Jews from the north would celebrate Passover on Thursday night. The Jews from the south would celebrate it on Friday. So here is Jesus with his disciples on this Thursday night, and they have made their way to the upper room. And as they have gathered now in the upper room, celebrating the Passover feast, celebrating the fact that God had passed over the children of Israel, all who applied blood to their doorpost, remembering that, reflecting on that together, that was the last supper meal. It was a Passover meal. And that was what we just celebrated with communion and reflected upon with communion. So if you get that setting on this Thursday night, as the chapter opens, that's what is being referred to on this final week. Verse one says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that hour that says he should depart from this world to be with the father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. A statement by John recognizing that this is finally that hour. It is coming down to the last 24 literal hours, but this is now that transfer time that, that Jesus has said all along, my hour has not yet come, now his hour had come. So everything we're reading from 13 on is significant with the thought that he is marching to the cross and we are reading some of the final words that he will say to his disciples. If you've ever been at a deathbed experience with somebody, somebody especially that you love and care for, I would imagine if we went around, you could share some of their very final words that you would reflect upon. The last, some of the last words my dad said to me on his deathbed was, it's gonna be okay. And he was reassuring family and reassured himself because he was a follower of Jesus Christ. And all of his life with all the mistakes and all the sin, he had surrendered his life to Christ and he could say it's going to be okay. And I listen carefully to deathbed words. I listen to these words of Christ as we're going to as well. But John's making an observation as he is recording this. And says it's before the feast of Passover and Jesus knew that his hour had come. So the disciples don't, they don't get it completely. There's more lessons for them. But Jesus knew that he would come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. He is going back to where he came from. He's going back to the presence of God the Father to take his place again on the throne. And he will go back to that place where the Father had sent him from. And having this experience on earth, having loved his own, his disciples, his followers. By the way, that would include us, as John will say later in the gospel. As he loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He was committed to walk this thing all the way through to the end, knowing at any time he could take his rights back in the divinity sense and respond with judgment. But he loved them to the end. And he loves us to the end. He will give everything, in other words, to the end. He will give everything in his mission full fruition until it's over and complete and it's finished. And he loved them to the end. John reminds us of that. And it says in verse two, it's, and supper being ended. So the Passover supper had now taken place. And watch how the atmosphere 
is interrupted. Now, this is going to be a little easier for us because we know the, the basic culture. We've studied it many times together. But as the verses describe it, we'll make a couple comments. Supper's over. You see the picture. It's still the upper room. And notice this insert that John puts. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Supper's over. The, the work, the evil work in Judas had already been implanted. He was going to betray him. So keep those two things in mind as the story continues. With that setting, Jesus, fully knowing or knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he, Jesus is fully conscious of all that. He's fully conscious that dinner is over, that this timing is here. He's fully conscious that Judas had had this implanted evil in his heart. And he knows he's going back to the Father, going to God. He rose from the supper table right at this moment, this hour, this particular time with all that knowledge. He rose from the supper table and laid aside his garments. And he took a towel and he girded himself, almost like an apron, takes off his outer garment, and he takes a, a towel and girds himself. And after that, dinner over, some of the disciples starting to look at him. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he was girded with. There's your setting. There's the context. If you can climb the stairs with me to the upper room and there's small talk going on and dialogue after the dinner, the Passover meal, not only small talk, but Luke's gospel tells us there was an argument taking place. Do you remember? It was who is going to be a great among the rest in the kingdom. So can you see Jesus hearing the talk with dinner over and seeing the elements on the table and hearing them pridefully say, I'll be right here and I'll be here. I bet you I'm over here. And they arguing about their prideful place. And Jesus knows that the hour has come and the clock is ticking. And apparently as they made their way to the upper room, no one had done what is often done at any house and any gathering, no one had taken the role of providing the basin and water to wash their feet. You know why they did that? They wore sandals and they would walk on dusty roads. And so it was a custom to at least wash your feet or only to wash your feet at every entrance of a house or a meal. And it hadn't been done. I always laugh uh, when I reflect back to some of the Bible studies that I pastored in Maui. And uh, when we'd have Bible study at our old little uh, chapel church, uh, you come up uh, to the few steps before you walk inside this little church or any home Bible study, and there'd be 30 pairs of slippers on the front because no one would walk in a house with their uh, slippers on. And the red dirt over there gets pretty dirty and tracks marks and stuff. And I often think of that picture in my mind when I think of Jesus now taking upon what he's about to do. And he is going to begin to wash his disciples' feet. He fills the basin and he has the towel and he takes on the role of a servant that was typically designed for it, most homes, the servant to do. And at any point, any of these disciples should have thought and could have thought and could have offered and it wasn't being done. Instead, on the night before he died, they're arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. And so in an act of both servitude and example and humility, Jesus girded, goes around with his basin and begins to wash their feet and to wipe them with the towel which he had, was girded with. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? What are you doing is the question. Are you washing my feet? He had the opportunity himself to wash Jesus' feet and his brothers. 
So he knows this role is for a servant and the master is now washing the disciples' feet. And Jesus responds in verse seven and answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. How often was that statement needed with the disciples? By the way, how often is that statement needed with me? God, what's going on? Hey, Mark, what I'm doing right now, you don't fully understand, but you'll understand later. And that's what he says to Peter. But Peter's in a different zone, and he responds by saying, you shall never wash my feet. He, he responds in, in somewhat of a prideful fashion and a prideful statement, and it's like, no, in the uh, original, no, you're not going to do that. Stop it, Jesus is the context there or the idea. Stop it, Jesus. You shall never wash my feet. Listen how Jesus responds to him. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. If you interrupt what I'm doing, then you will have no part of me. Watch how fast Peter changes. He doesn't get it completely, but when he hears that statement, you will have no part with me. He responds again, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He, he switches from, you're not going to do that to, well, wait a minute, don't just do my feet, then do my, if I'm not gonna have any part with you, then give me a bath. <laughs> and watch what Jesus says, because it's for all of us, not just Peter. He says, then wash my feet, my hands, my head. Jesus speaks. And he says, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet. Typically, they would start their day with a bath, but the walking would make their feet dirty. What a picture this is for our spiritual journey. And watch what Jesus says. He who has bathed only, uh, excuse me, needs only to wash his feet, but he is completely clean. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And Peter, you are clean, but not all of you, as he looks around the table. And I, the spiritual connection is, Peter, you only need to have the dirty part clean because you're already saved. That's what Jesus is saying to Peter. We stumble, we sin, we get dirty. Let me wash you again. Let me forgive you again. But you've already had a bath, spiritually speaking. You're already saved. So it's just your feet, symbolically here, and literally. It needed to be done. No one else did it. So he says to him, that one who has bathed only needs his feet washed, but is completely clean. And you are clean, you are saved, but not all of you. Of course, Judas is in the room. And Jesus is aware, as we mentioned earlier, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So, so much is happening. The Passover itself is so symbolic, especially for Jews to remember that the death angel passed over because of the blood. And here on the night, and then on the day of his crucifixion, when all these temple lambs will be sacrificed, Jesus ties it again together and says, listen guys, if you have salvation in me, if you're saved, you don't need to be saved again, you're clean. But when you get dirty, and we do, then let me just take care of that for you. So Jesus speaks that direction to Peter and it says in verse 12, so when he had washed their feet and taken his garment and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done for you? Why about that room was silent. <laughs> They're a little humiliated because they didn't jump ahead and do what the servant sh should have done. But he asked this question just right after he washes their feet. He says, do you know what I have done to you? With this act just there, 
too warm. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If then your Lord and your teacher, by your own words, if your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Remember the conversation taking place? I'm better than you. I bet I'm on the right hand of Jesus. I bet my place is higher. And all the pride and argument is going on why Jesus publicly before them demonstrates humility and servanthood. And here's your lesson. If I'm your Lord and teacher and I wash your feet, get this message, boys. You ought to wash one another's feet. That's what servants do. For I, and it's all set in these next words in verse uh, 15. For I have given you an example. You want to know an example of how to live? Jesus started with his disciples and we are his disciples. He said, I just have given you an example. You humble yourself. If you're going to love one another, and remember Jesus loved them all the way to the end. This is getting very close to the end. If you're going to love one another, follow my example that you should do as I have done to you. Christianity 101 made simple. What should I do in this situation? Jesus says, what have I done to you? Forgive, serve, love, help in healing, help in acts of kindness. We follow the, not only the ministry of Jesus through the gospels, but we follow the example of Jesus. And he says, guys, you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. I just did this for you. You're not greater than me by your own admission. I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. And he ties back into where he's going. If you know these things, here's the other part of our 101 class. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The challenge for many of us as Christians, we know it academically. We're studying it this morning. But you know where the blessing of God comes or when it comes? When we do these things. When we serve like Jesus served. When we give like Jesus gives. When we reach out and humble ourselves as he is humbling himself at the Passover table, will humble himself when he's scourged, will humble himself when he hangs on a cross. Any time had the power to stop it. He says, it's not what you know, it's what you do with it. And if you want blessing of God, disciples around this table, then do these things. Blessed are you if you do them. You know, I always think of uh, great acts of service and I like watching and hearing the stories of someone that saves a life or a child plucked from a river or someone diving. And do you remember the old Potomac story in the 80s when the uh, plane had gone down in the Potomac and one man jumps from the bridge into this ice cold water to save the, I think she was a flight attendant who was just going down for the last time. Heroic story, certainly heroic. But, you know, there are those times in life that those things happen Jesus says live your life that way not just physically to save a life sometimes we've been able to help people that's a wonderful thing sometimes we do it through actual ministries pray that that happens in St. Cloud and Ben pray that it happens tonight in Anaheim because there's a lot of great ministries happening beyond the salvation message but the blessing of just knowing what Jesus said until it's applied in some way, however God calls you to do it, until it's applied and done, there's no blessing. But when it's done, when it's lived out, then blessing comes. And that can be through a prayer, it can be through a variety of ways of encouragement. I'm wondering who did the dishes that night. <laughs> After that example of feet being washed and a dirty towel around Jesus, and he sits back down to tell this. Remember, they're all inclining, reclining at table in the way that they ate. So everyone's feet were kind of exposed. 
I wonder who said, oh, you know, I, I got the bill, Jesus. <laughs> or let me take care of dishes tonight. The lesson would linger. And isn't it fascinating that it's during Passover that he describes what he will be doing and invites them to do the same. It's quite a weekend. I, I hope, uh, I'm glad this is a four day weekend for many because I, I think we need extra time to reflect on the wonderful privilege it is to be an American, the privilege it is to say thank you to those who paid the sacrifice, but in all of it to say thank you Jesus that you have done that for us, regardless of what country we are from, and you have shown us how to live. We are designed for this day and age, and we will have ministry opportunities, and we will have service opportunities. And I'd like to close uh, with not only appreciating our country as we've been singing this morning, but asking the Lord as a child of yours, as a disciple of yours who lives in America, would you show me how to take what I know and do the ministry you call me to do? I'm not asking you necessarily to discover something new. Maybe for some of you it will be. And God will show you someone or something uh, additional to what you're doing now. But would you just take the time on this 4th of July weekend to thank God certainly for our country. We'll pray that in a minute. But also to say thank you, God, for the privilege of understanding and following a servant, Jesus Christ, who gave us an example of how to serve. Mm -hmm. And maybe as you do that, you're thanking God for those who paid the ultimate price as we celebrate this weekend together. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father, just as we enter into some quiet time of reflection, and we are so appreciative of our country and those who have died to make it free, with all the twisted stuff that's out there, we're, we're going to brush it aside and just say to you, as our example, God, would you speak to us, not only the privilege of where we live and the relationship with Christ, but our duty and our calling with what we know. So give us some quiet time of reflection here to personalize to you and to reflect to you our appreciation and our love to you as we celebrate. Oh.